Once again, I had submitted to nonsense, to the frivolity of invention for invention's sake, resorting to the unexpected as if it were some kind of deus ex machina. Again, I had squandered the wise ancient advice adorning the frontispiece of my literary ethic. Simplify, my son, simplify. I had managed to write a few good things by following, quite by accident, that advice. What a waste! Only through minimalism is it possible to achieve the asymmetry that for me is the flower of art. Complications inevitably form heavy symmetries, which are vulgar and overwrought. But my mania, to be constantly adding things, episodes, characters, paragraphs, to be constantly veering off course, branching out, is fatal. It must be due to insecurity, fear that the basics are not enough, so I have to keep adding more and more adornment until I achieve a kind of surrealist rococo, which exasperates me more than it does anybody else. Hey, this is David. This is Frida. And this is Nick. And welcome to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast, where today we're talking about Cesar Ida's The Literary Conference. So Frida, if you can, start us out on what exactly this short, little, compact book really is about. Okay. Um, <laughs> Cesar Ida's stories are not about something. It's about what is happening, but there's no plot. There's no actual plot. But it's simple. Uh, there's this writer named Cesaraida as a character that is attending a congress in Venezuela, not because of the conference itself, because, but because he wants to clone Carlos Fuentes and then conquer the world, of course. <laughs> Naturally. So that's what, what it's about. It's about what is happening to him in this weird environment, uh, in a nightmarish, uh, weird <laughs> moments, but... Yeah, that's that's pretty much what it's about. It's um, in the middle. There are all, there are all, all other uh, stories, but that's made the main plot. So where do we where do we start in kind of digging into this? Because you know, okay, so we got a, a recap of the plot, which sounds insane because it is. But Cesar Ida's stories are always kind of about the idea of a story, like the structure of a story, and playing with that. And I guess this specific one, he kind of opens up and in the main section once the novella gets going where he talks a lot about the idea of translation and what what he's doing in this story as he jumps in to translate different portions and it brings up the idea of just telling stories in general and how do they get from either reality into fiction or maybe there's no such thing as reality so just that whole kind of concept that he's working with david how do you how do you start to parse through that you mentioned reality, and I think there's a, a little quote which I think is sort of references this. I was quite excited to find myself face to face with it. It doesn't matter what you know about a famous object, being in its presence is altogether a different story. You must find that sensation of reality, peel back the veil of dreams, which is the substance of reality, and rise to the occasion of the moment, the Everest of the moment. And there he's talking about disentangling that knot that the first part of the book deals with, that bizarre Makuto line. <laughs> but I think that line, that idea of peeling back the veil of dreams, which is the substance of reality, gets at kind of what you're dealing with when you read his books. The real is the dream in his fiction. There's really no, there's no separation between the two. It doesn't feel that way when you read it. And you mentioned the word translation. He brings this up a lot. That he's going to, okay, now let me stop. There, there's a lot of direct address to the reader. Let me stop and, and do a new translation of the, of the idea of the story. And each one is almost like him, him sort of editing himself in the process, trying to come up with a different version of what he's trying to say, which, again, is difficult to grasp because it's wrapped in this dream, this constantly shifting dream. Yes, I agree. Um, the thing that I, I, I feel is difficult to read in uh, Ida in general is that he's, he does not state he, he's talking about the dream. He just throws all the information to the reader and the reader has to figure out what the hell is happening because things <laughs> just suddenly change. There's no explanation on why 
this specific thing is happening to the character. And it's, it's very confusing because if you, you're maybe thinking, okay, this, there's this Makuto line, there's a treasure, okay, and he's going to attend the Congress, but the book, the book has the Congress, the, the, uh, what, it's just confusing <laughs> because everything is, is just tangled. And it, it, I, I think it's, it also has to, uh, has to do with the fact that he's creating his own literary uh, canons in his own reality, in his novels, in his uh, short stories. So you have to just believe what he's uh, offering to you as a reader, because otherwise you're just going to hate it. And uh, you're going to think, okay, this is not believable. This is not uh, possible to happen in reality. But what is reality anyway? Yeah. And so you kind of touched on that beginning weird part, the Makuto line, and which I guess a quick summary because it doesn't really fit all that well into the rest of the story either is just he's essentially he solves an age old physical puzzle that is basically a large scale bow and arrow. I understand it to be that old pirates created to bury sunken treasure. And he goes on this whole thing. And this is how the how the story opens. He goes on this whole thing about how he's not necessarily a genius. It was just his perfect sort of statistically probable combination of events and books that he's read and things that he's experienced allowed him to very quickly solve this thing. And it's kind of just this grand non sequitur into the next chunk, which is the bulk of the story, which doesn't really ever refer that much back to the whole point of solving the puzzle in the first place. He mentions it a couple times because it makes him rich and wealthy and there's some level of, of noteworthiness that people see in him after that. But it's really it's really kind of disjointed. And that, in addition to kind of the, the dreamlike aspects and separating the line between reality and, and fiction and stuff like that, I think that's the thing that really stands out to me of this is it's it's disjointed it's it careens in different directions at 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 whatever whim and i think he has a plan for how it's all connected because he's constantly changing it in real time but i think i think he's also aware of the fact of that idea of just modifying it as you write that there's a flow to it and i think i think that's another piece of this is just how how he embraces his writing style, which he kind of refers to as was it the constant, constant flight forward, and so it's almost like you can see him poking fun at his own structure as he's going about doing it, as he follows one story into a hole that has sort of a dead end, and then he sort of just immediately restarts into another chunk. So, it's yeah, it's as Frida kind of mentioned, it's not necessarily I don't know, it's not the not the tightly woven tail by any means it's more just like this collection of finely tuned chaos i suppose i don't know freedom mentioned that he usually doesn't announce that he's that you're in the dream but he always announces that you're in a story that you're in a fiction yes and he makes fun of that because yes. he will say there wasn't i don't know in the english translation but in, in spanish it starts uh, in the second part of the book as uh, once upon a time. So <laughs> he's just making fun of the reader because you know you're not reading a short story uh, from uh, a fairy tale. You're reading <laughs> something totally different. So I, th I think you have, you have to have quite a different mindset if you want to read this and enjoy it because otherwise it's no good. You definitely have to be willing to to enter the the sort of flow state of his mind in the moment of the creation, right? If you ever pick up any of his books, you'll notice at the end of each of his short works, he, there's a date, there's a month and a year, which is when he finished writing it. And that goes back to what you mentioned, Nick, the constant flight forward. So he's when he sits down and writes these things, as far as I can tell from everything I've read, he doesn't really revise, he doesn't really change much, he just sort of... And he doesn't really have a plan necessarily. And you can so kind of see in his work some of, some of them feel more cohesive. Like the first thing that I read from him was uh, an episode in the life of a landscape painter. Yeah, that and one's that, great. It's amazing. It's definitely more paced and more structured. Like it feels much more like a, like a narrative 
And then other of his books I've read that are also a little little out there. But this definitely feels the most dreamlike, but also the most self-aware of the limitations or the drawbacks of his own writing style, which goes back to kind of the quote that I opened with, where that's that's the narrator describing his experience watching one of his older plays. And it almost felt like C- Cesar Ira sort of admitting, hey, you know, <laughs> sometimes sometimes I get carried away by my own method of creation. Yeah. And actually, I want to read the one paragraph where he basically describes that method because I think it kind of ties all this together. So he goes uh, earlier in the story to say, in my case, nothing returns. Everything races forward, savagely being pushed from behind by what keeps coming through that accursed valve. This image brought to its peak of maturation in my vertiginous reflections revealed to me the path to the solution, which I forcefully put into practice whenever I have time and feel like it. The solution is none other than the greatly overused, parentheses, by me, escape <laughs> forward. <laughs> Since turning back is off limits, forward, to the bitter end, running, flying, gliding, using up all the possibilities, the conquest of tranquility through the din of the battlefield, the vehicle is language, what else? Because the valve is language, therein lie the root of the problem, which doesn't mean that once in a while, such as during those sessions at the pool, I didn't attempt a more conventional method by relaxing, by trying to forget everything, by taking a short vacation. So he kind of, you know, he's at the mercy of, of his own style. And I think it's almost like as he's writing this story, he needed to explain that because he felt the thing kind of careening out of control in a way. So he's like, hey, I got to really tell you what's going on here by, again, sort of breaking, you know, that wall and re-explaining to you not only that this is fiction, but exactly what kind of fiction it is. Yeah. From what I know, um, he has a lot of this reflections and you know, insights in his books. So probably if we separate everything, it's a great author. It's a great author for everybody because you have great small insights about what it means to be a writer, what it means to uh, just let the flow of your ideas go. And you have fantasy, great fantasy stories or drama stories or surrealist stories. But the problem is that it's all mixed. So, yeah, I do agree. He is, he's really good at explaining what, what he does in his brain to create <laughs> what he's creating. And one thing that I read that is interesting is that he's a really old school writer. He writes by hand uh-huh. in cafes. And what he says is that he takes a long time to think about what he's going to write, just like Marcel Proust. He just waits uh, a long time to get this a very specific line. He write it, writes it down, and then he doesn't need to correct. And to be fair, Proust did the same thing. Okay. He didn't correct anything. He just did it everything in his brain. So I think if, if, if we consider all that, it's, it's not that bad. <laughs> Probably if he used a computer, it would be much worse. <laughs> but but I think it's it's a good uh, it's a good thing that he's doing this. So yeah, that that sort of kind of goes against a little bit of the. I mean, I guess it is a constant flight forward. It's just a much slower flight than I was a imagining. Methodical one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And you both kind of hit on something of, and I think we all did about this being very, very much his his world that you either accept or reject as a reader. And Nick, you mentioned how he's the unique person who can solve the the puzzle that is the Makuto line. And there, there's a quote in here. I just want to read this real quick. It says, Every mind is shaped by its own experiences and memories and knowledge. And what makes it unique is the grand total and extremely personal nature of the collection of all the data that have made it what it is. Each person possesses a mind with powers that are, whether great or small, always unique. Powers that belong to them and to them alone. And then, well, he kind of goes on from there. But when you read Ira, you're really getting all of his influences, all of his history, all of his his sort of obsession with storytelling. It kind of comes out. And you see that in his selection of who the mad scientist decides to <laughs> to clone, you see that in his <laughs> interviews, you see that. So did you guys catch a lot of his sort of references to 
to literary works and ideas in general? Um, okay, so um, I must say that this uh, Carlos Fuentes thing, the clones and everything, it's it's a it's a joke. It's yeah. he didn't he he hated all these writers from the boom era, mm. so from the '60s, such as uh, Garcia Marquez. Carlos Fuentes, Vargas Llosa, and he the one he hates the most is Julio Cortázar. He says he's a bad Borges. The the best Cortázar is a bad Borges. That's his he, he became very famous because of that quote. Oh, okay. So, if we consider that, uh he's making a joke and in fact, uh a couple of years later in 2003, Carlos Fuentes uh replied to to this joke of the clones. Uh, by saying that Ida is going to win the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2020. <laughs> so it's all a joke, basically. <laughs> so, so he's basically saying by cloning him, he's, he's making fun of the literary world because everybody wants to be him. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that as, as the giant silkworms are, are taking over the, the town and, and Carlos is in his fancy car, there's some comment about, like, I wonder if the liter literary hierarchy holds up in moments like these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because everything. It's quite a, it's, it's a comment I didn't stop thinking until I read uh, this um, article by Gustavo Pierre Herrera Lopez. He, he basically says that he perfa prefers the face of to face a monster, like the silkworm, than having doubles of boom writers, <laughs> which is, I think it's pretty accurate. I didn't stop thinking about it, but it's true because yeah. Ida, I think he uh, identifies himself much more with surrealists, with uh, Cantelatomont and other writers that are uh, experimental and not as uh, mainstream, we could say, as mm. the boom writers. Um, so the other thing I want to just mention really quickly is that uh, some uh, academics say that Aira be be um, belongs to uh, this movement from writers in Argentina that is called Neo Barroco or Neo, Bar Neo Barroso. Um, so what it, what it is is basically a group of writers that grew up in the 60s and towards the 80s, they become uh, writers. And they became writers, and they were against all institutions. So they just wrote in super extreme use of language. They used a lot of access and experimental methods. They used violence. They used sex and other super controversial topics to just express themselves because they felt they were oppressed by the... the um, political uh, moment in in the uh, dictatorship that was in Argentina in that time. So thinking about that, it makes sense. It's not the best, but it makes sense. Yeah. And there's, there's also, there was uh, that interview that we had, at least David, you had sent uh, before we started recording that uh, had a lot of comments by the author just on kind of his own process. And there was one interesting thing that ties back to this in which, uh, the fictional Cesar Ida in this story is a translator, right? And so a lot of the early work of the real life Cesar Ida was actually as a translator. And he mentions translating the essentially pulp because it cost or it, it made him the same amount of money and it was so much easier to translate. And so there's also a layer of him taking some of this popular stuff and using it as a basis for this extreme experiment or extreme experimental aspect, right? And you yeah. get that in this because it's sort of a bizarre sci-fi type of movie thing. movie type of feel. Yeah, movie. yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and you get it in like, you know, in <laughs> Ghosts, right? That, you know, that's sort of this super bizarre ghost story and a lot of the stories in the musical brain, like that collection are just like, they're, they're picking apart these like popular moments in ways that don't fit at all with what that kind of topic is. And so I think that, that was definitely a thing that kind of like stood out and hooked me a bit. And uh, I don't know, I know the whole, yeah, the whole like sci-fi, like silkworm. It's just, it's, uh, it's enjoyable, actually. Attack of the I, giant silkworms. Yeah. yeah, right. That came from Carlos Fuentes' you know, Nectar. beautifully exquisite blue tie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
throughout it, it's very playful. Yes. Uh, recently, I was reading um, this book that it's about surrealist games, and I found there something that is worth it because uh, they talk about translations, but not on, on language. Uh, they talk about translation on how we represent reality. So uh, if we were s supposed to uh, say, oh, okay, uh, choose an image that would describe your parents, the correct way to do this is not by choosing the photograph of your parents, because that would be very obvious, but to make a metaphor and use maybe the sun and the moon or, I don't know, salt and pepper or stuff like that. Just by analogy, an, an analogy uh, game. So I think Aida is doing exactly the same because he's uh, using his tail to create another tail to create another tail. So, and they're all part of the same story. So I think he's just doing that, just changing the way we see the previous tail by giving us a new translation of what he's doing. Yeah, and there's also that one paragraph where he talks about the idea of the blind translation, which is essentially the idea that, you know, you can translate something, but if you're not an expert on the subject, it you may lose the stuff in between, you know? And I guess I'll, I'll read some of it, right, where he goes, um, let's see, what's a good spot to start? Of course, there is such a thing as blind translation, the act of mechanically transposing one language to another without passing through the content which is what professional translators do when they come across a technical and detailed description of a machine or process. Then he goes on to say that by translating correctly, sentence by sentence, the entire page, the translation will turn out well. They will continue to be as happily ignorant as they were at the beginning, and they will get paid for their work. After all, they are paid to know the language, not the subject matter. And so again, like these also tying it into one of the classic realities of translation is it's still coming through a filter of, of one person. Hence the story at the beginning, which is referencing an independent collection of experiences and knowledge and, and things within one person will inevitably skew or distort something in that direction. And of course, in this podcast, you know, Frida, you read it in Spanish. In Spanish. <laughs> we read it in English. So we're actually doing that in real time. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I love I love that he is so aware of these mechanisms at play, and has no problem just sort of pausing or translating or transitioning, however you define it, in the middle of the story, to kind of add that layer of detail in. It's it's still it it turns and pivots like crazy, but I think the more we kind of talk about it, I I appreciate a lot of these gems that are kind of buried in there. If you get caught up or wrapped up in trying to like figure out the plot and the sequencing of things, then you're not going to have a good time. You just got to go along with it, man. You just got to gotta go with the flow or flow with the go. <laughs> you got to feed forward. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we actually didn't mention Borges. Like the first we didn't time mention ever. Borges. Oh. That's well, we, you know oh, uh, what's going to go at the end of the episode now. <laughs> Borges. Borges. Borges?